The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this, the first Sunday of Lent. We are now in our Lenten season, which we shall be super excited about, right? (laughs) No, Lent is a good season. It's a challenging season, but it is a season that has the juxtaposition of sorrow and struggle, but also great joy and love. If you wonder how those two things coincide, please join us every Wednesday for our, Ash Wen- for our Lenten, uh, Lenten series as we look at the landmarks of Lent uh, every week with a soup supper starting at 6 and then a service at 6.45 that will meditate and focus on the different aspects and the focuses of Jesus as he preaches through his ministry on his way to the cross. Please join us uh, each of these nights as we grow closer to our God, to Jesus Christ. It will be a wonderful journey with all of you. Also, if you may have noticed, we are selling our spaghetti tickets, uh, spaghetti dinner tickets. Please see, I'm not sure who's selling them out there at the moment, but whoever's selling them out there, they're out in the front. Please join us. Oh, there we go, Courtney. Courtney will be there. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, Please see Courtney for more information about that. It is looking to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to the spaghetti dinner. There will be a number of raffles, and those raffles, I've heard that there's some chocolate involved. Sounds like good things to me. Uh, Please join us for all of that. That'll be great. More information in the bulletin of all the other events coming up. Uh, One other major one is that on the first Sunday of March, we will be starting in with our First Communion classes. If you have somebody who's within the range for First Communion, please let us know, as we will be starting up uh, during our Sunday school hour at 9.30. I think that's all the information that I have. (laughs) With that, please stand as you are able, as we begin with a confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Christ. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ.
from Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From 1 Peter, Christ also suffered for sins once, and once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few that is, eight persons were saved through water. And baptis baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel, according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice from the heavens, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, walk with us daily. Show us your grace, your kingdom, your compassion. Lead us onward in the midst of struggles. Guide us forward to be in grace. May we be disciples, learners at your feet. May we share to the world the good news of God. Amen. There's a phrase that I don't know who to attribute to, but it's a good one you've probably heard. It's about bravery. It's that bravery is not the absence of fear, but it is going forward, choosing to do what you need to in the midst of fear. You've probably heard that or in some variation of that. I find that to be true. And today, as we ponder the Scriptures and listen to the Word of God, I want you to think about the, one, the notion of temptation. What does temptation and this understanding of bravery have in common? Think about that as we pray and look through the Scriptures. <clears throat> Starting with somebody who's fairly brave within the story of the Bible, starting in Genesis, there is a man named Noah. We know this story. We love this story. It's a beloved story of, that we tell with, to children all the time. It's also a really dark and adult story, if you pay attention fully. It's a story about the world being washed away in water, in loss, in darkness. But one man who is good and righteous, is chosen by God, who actually listens to God, which that's a key point, because often God will speak and people will refuse to listen. But a good man chooses to listen to God and responds, and out of trust and with bravery, goes about building an ark in the middle of nowhere, while others mock and deride him for something they think is foolish until the day that the flood comes, until the world is washed away. And for 40 days, is what we see, for 40 days and 40 nights, Noah and his family and the animals that God has saved are in this boat. It must have been an awful cacophony. Can you imagine being in a boat full of animals as it sways back and forth? I don't think it would have smelled nice. I don't think it would have been nice, and I don't think it would have sounded nice either. But for 40 days and 40 nights, these people, these animals, are safe, even amidst the, the trials of the storm. And then when they finally find land once more, we get this fascinating moment where God, the God of the universe, the God of creation, the God of justice, and grace. That God comes to Noah and his family and the entire world, the animals and creation itself, and creates a new covenant that there will no longer be death and destruction by a great worldwide flood, that there will be a new life to live after this, that there will be a change and a transformation. 
and he marks it with a rainbow. Now, lots of people try to use the rainbow nowadays in our modern world for all sorts of things. My favorite use of them is the sandals. Have you ever seen rainbow sandals? They're made in San Clemente, California. Guess where I'm from. <laughs> but they're really great sandals. If you have a chance to buy a pair, they last you forever. I wish that would be a good sponsor. Could anybody work on that? <laughs> but they are, but there's lots of people who use rainbows. But rainbows are a Jewish and out of Judaism, a Christian symbol. They're a symbol of this covenant between God and creation, between God and Noah. A promise of protection, a promise of the putting down of God's wrath, a promise of God's love. And it's fascinating, because the thing about a rainbow is, when does it show up? Is it an everyday appearance, or does it come with and after the storm? God's promise is there in the midst of trial. God's promise is there after the trial. God's love is there even amidst the challenges of the world. That's something to think about. That symbol is something to ponder. Because I think that what we see is that God, God calls us to good. God calls us to love. God calls us to great, God, uh, 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 towards greatness. But God also calls us towards challenge, towards things that are difficult. God walks with us through them and abides with us in before, in, and after. Always loving, always showing magnificence and beauty, even if it's hard to see. And then I think about our gospel text with this man, Jesus. The man, Jesus, who has come from Nazareth, which in Jesus' day was kind of a nowhere place. It wasn't known for having the powerful or the wealthy. It wasn't known to be a great place of industry and prosperity. It was kind of a backwater, full of laborers. But Jesus of Nazareth comes from there to the River Jordan, is baptized by John, and then this great cosmic event which would have been terrifying and astounding to see, where the heavens are ripped asunder. Anybody know what that might look like? <laughs> Anybody else be terrified if the sky suddenly opened up and my, your perceptions were altered for a minute? I wouldn't be okay. And a spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, and it sends him out immediately into the wilderness that place of wild, that place where danger is ever-present, that place where things are uncomfortable. There is no home for him to lay his head. There is no pillow that is comfortable. There is just the wilderness. Now, in our Mark text, we get the shortest version of this because Mark is always quick and to the point and always with use of the word ethus in Greek. Uh, today, one of the uses of that is translated to just, just as he came out of the waters, the heavens opened up, but the Greek word would have been immediately. And immediately, Jesus is also sent into that wilderness place, to a place of challenge, to a place of trial. And if we think about this, even though it's the shortest version here in, uh, in and with our two other texts that go into much greater detail, Matthew and Luke, we see that during this 40 days of trial and temptation in the wilderness, Jesus does things that are hard. This isn't an easy trip into the wild. He's not glamping, that's for sure. Jesus fasts for 40 days. Has anybody fasted before? When I've tried Eight hours in, I was constantly complaining about food. It was like a constant refrain. Could you imagine 40 days? Pastors have tried it, uh, people of faith have tried it, and some have died because it's that strenuous on the body. 40 days of eating nothing, drinking little, 
of praying, of quiet. None, never mind, you're in the wilderness during this period. And it makes me question, so often the image that we see of Jesus is this nice, placid, kind of gentle-looking person. Somebody with soft features, slightly feminine, even though a man. Somebody, again, the danger of images, and I'm not to degrading some of our images that we have of Jesus, but we get this image, and it's so prevalent in our world, and he's kind of Scandinavian-looking, tall and slender and good-looking in a lot of art and images. But what kind of guy goes into the wilderness willingly, fast for 40 days, and makes it? Is it somebody who's gentle and weak? Is it just that banali, nice guy? I'm not so sure. Because if I read this text, and I read the texts about this time period, I see somebody rough. Somebody who is capable of living in the wilderness among the wild beasts, first of all. I couldn't do it. Anybody else? Well, let's think about that image a little bit more. Who does Jesus call? Not just his character, but what are the types of people that Jesus calls? Well, Jesus is a carpenter. Anybody know any carpenters? How uh, gentle and soft-handed are they? Not so much? What about fishermen? Because that's who Jesus immediately calls, four fishermen, and then he starts calling other people. But who here knows some good, salty fishermen? How uh, PC are they? That's right. They're real people, rough and tumble people. And it doesn't matter what background they're from, because everybody has their rough edges, everybody has their hard points, everybody has those moments that are not quite refined. But Jesus comes to us anyway. And that's the whole point. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes into the world and accepts the challenges of that reality. The Christian faith is based around the person of Christ being far more than just a man or some nice dude with some nice things to say. Because we believe that this man, Jesus Christ, who came out of the waters in the Jordan, that that man who went into the wilderness and faced trials and temptations, who defeats the devil, that this man, Jesus, who teaches and preaches, often coming into, cons- into a challenge and to fighting with the religious leaders, the moral authorities around him, the political authorities around him, and never, ever staying quiet when he should have in order to keep the peace, that that Jesus, who never sinned, who never did wrong, but was persecuted and sent to a cross, one of the worst ways to die in the known world, that that Jesus is also the Son of God. And more than that, He is God Himself. He is God come in human flesh, experiencing truly the hunger that He felt in that 40 days, experiencing the pain of loss and the cross, of weeping and cry, uh, over those who he loved, seeing them die. Jesus, who entered into a relationship, into reality, and touched lepers and the sick, while the rest of the world overlooked them and pretended they didn't exist. That God himself has come into this world and walked with us through all of the pain and the sorrow that we have experienced. And he loved and he joked and he celebrated all through it. That is the person of Christ, and that's the image that I am fascinated by, the one that draws me. It's not this nice little meek Jesus. It's the Lion of Judah. It's the man who stands against the injustices of the world around him and calls people to their sins and to repent from them. Have you ever called somebody out for something they've done wrong? Is it easy? Jesus does that like 
every other word. (laughs) The Son of God is not just nice. He is powerful, He is strong, He is righteous, and He is a warrior. The person that we see in Jesus, just in these short verses from Mark, is a man who runs towards the fire. A man who runs towards the sound of gunfire, not away from it. This is the one who sees the challenges and says, I'm going. Who answers the call when nobody else is willing to pick up the phone. And this is who we are called to follow and to emulate. This is the Son of God who calls us to love others just as powerfully as He loves us. This is God walking with you through your temptations, your doubts, and your fears, calling you to live for righteousness, for holiness, and for goodness. At the beginning of this sermon, I asked you, or I shared with you a quote, and I asked you to think about how does bravery being not the absence of fear, but the ability to choose to act in the face of it is similar to temptation. Or how it's connected to temptation. And I believe it's connected in this way. All of us feel the temptations of the world. Nobody is purely good here. As great as we all are, we all have our temptations. Am I alone in that? No? Because if I am, I'm feeling like there's some lying going on. (laughs) All of us have our weaknesses and our temptations. Often, I hear people pray to have their temptations taken from them. That's not real. If you lose one temptation, you end up getting another one. And even Jesus is tempted by the devil. Think about what that means. The Son of God, who never sinned, still had temptations, but He never fell to them. He had fears. He prays in the Garden of Gethsemane for this to pass from Him, but He keeps going on. The difference, or the the reality and the similarity is that even when we have fears, when we have temptations, we are to still choose to be brave. We are to still choose to be holy. We are to ask God to walk with us, to help us resist, to resist. And when we fall, because none of us are perfect, to come to God in truth, confessing our sins honestly and deeply and asking for forgiveness. That's what it means to be a Christian. To follow that man in that image, the man that we see in the Scriptures, to follow God Himself through the storm and into the promised land of God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, my prayer for you is that you be brave that you be courageous, that you be as strong, as truthful, as just, as loving as Christ, and that when temptation, the temptations of this world strike at you, you keep going, living for holiness and righteousness, that you fight the devil, that you win, that you challenge, that you be a threat to the structures of this world that deny God and God's love. People of God, Here is Christ, come for you. May you see him, may you know him, and may you be ever changed by his grace and his love. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it is now, ever was, and always will be, world without end. Amen.
with the whole church, let us profess our faith. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. God of our truth, the ark of your church has room for many expressions of faith. We give thanks for voices that challenge and awaken your people, especially that of Martin Luther, renewer of the church, whom we commemorate today. Hear us, O God. Your mercy, your mercy is great. God, our Maker, you remember your covenant with the earth and its inhabitants. Rescue communities and creatures hurting from natural disasters. Preserve species and habitats endangered by human carelessness and disregard. Hear us, O God. God, our light, you know our weakness. Free all who govern from the temptations of power. Sustain all who work for human rights in every nation. We pray especially for peaceful resolutions to the conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy, mercy is great. God, our help, you care for your beloved children. Comfort all who are grieving, ill, afraid, in pain, or in despair. Feed hungry people living in food deserts. Protect any at risk from exploitation and abuse. Hear us, O God. God, our home, you gather your people. Grant us health and safety as we assemble. Keep us mindful of any who are homebound, hospitalized, convalescing, or traveling, especially Bev, Christine, and Erwin. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. God, our companion, you walk alongside us. Be with those we name now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. God, our hope, you promise eternal life to your beloved children. We remember with gratitude those who have lived and died in faith. Grant that we may also dwell with you in everlasting peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that peace. Peace be with you.
us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and, and the, the host, host of this meal. meal. Bless those gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with all of our justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wellsprings, we bless and magnify you. You lead your people, Israel, through the desert and provided them water from a rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. And so we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood, given for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your coming for this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit upon this holy food and on all the baptized gathered for this feast. Wash away all sin, that we may be revived for your journey to love, Christ, uh, love by Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come.
Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. love, the courage to follow Christ in the way of the cross, and the guidance of the Spirit in the desert places of our world be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. 